Well, as we continue our wonderful exploration into the book of Ephesians, may I invite you to turn there with me, Ephesians chapter 6, the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians. If you're using the Bible in front of the seat, or in the seat in front of you, uh, you will find this on page 900. 79, 979, Ephesians chapter 6, we'll begin in verse 5, I'll ask the congregation to stand in honor of the public reading of God's word. This is what God says. Verse 5. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them. And stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. God has spoken. May God give us ears to hear. Let's pray. Lord, we come now before you, recognizing that apart from your grace, we will look at this book and see nothing. But Lord, in your grace, out of your abundant mercy towards us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can look at your word and see beauty. See the wonder that the God who is holy, who has never sinned, never lied, never died, can look upon a fallen people, corrupt in nature, and say, I will ransom them back from the captivity. I will make them my people again. And through the work of Christ, you've done that. And now, Lord, we look at your word and we say, Lord, tell us how to live. Show us how to live as a ransomed people, bought by the precious, precious blood of the Lamb. Help us, Lord, in this now as we give ourselves to this text. Change our hearts. Give us ears to hear. And that, Father, it would be far from us to by our deeds deny you in any sense. May that no longer be the way we are in our homes and in our workplace. For Christ's sake, we pray these things. Amen. May be seated. I'm not sure anybody can read this passage unless they have their head in the sand, which would be a very uncomfortable place to put your head. And they can't look at this passage without saying, slavery. Hmm. Such a reality that slavery is addressed in the Bible here and is not condemned outright, it seems, at least on the front of it. It can gnaw at you, potentially. You notice here, Paul does not say slaves protest against your slave masters. Paul does not say slaves rise up and defeat your masters. No, rather, Paul says slaves, bondservants, obey, submit to your earthly masters. And the word bondservants here, some of your translations will be slaves. It's the Greek word doulos. It means slave. So what do we do? As a people who have abolished the slave trade, what do we do with slavery here? And friends, if we let ourselves, we can so easily take the European and American slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, the abomination of that, the, the reality of the Civil War era, and 
the abomination of the way people were treated then, and we can paste that experience right into that text that we just read. We could paste it right into Ephesians 6, and that would be absolutely wrong. I mean, you can't take the reality of what you know about entire people groups, entire ethnicities being enslaved against their will because of their skin color, because of their ethnicity, and say, that's what Ephesians 6 is talking about. It's not right. It's just simply not accurate. Because that's not Paul's day. So the question then is, of course, what's the difference then? What's the difference between our understanding of slavery as we look back at our more modern history and see the atrocity of it then and the slavery of Paul's day in the context of Ephesians 6? I've got five things to consider as a way of introduction. Five things, quickly. What do we do with the difference? Number one, the slavery of Paul's day was not based strictly on ethnicity. Say that again. The slavery of Paul's day was not based strictly on ethnicity. Actually, it had very little to do with the shade of your skin. You could become a slave for all kinds of reasons. You could sell yourself into slavery so that you could attach yourself to a family that was well off. You come under their protection. You could sell yourself into slavery for your own good. You could become a slave because you were captured in the midst of a war. And rather than face execution, you were grafted into a family. You were saved, in a way, from death by the conquering people. You could also be a slave for a time. You could sell yourself into slavery for a period agreed upon by you and the master to say, I want to pay off a debt. I want to reach a certain economic threshold, much like we might think employees and employers operate in our day to day. This was simply not the slave trade that you and I immediately think of of the 19th century. It was not based strictly on ethnicity. Number two, some slaves loved their masters. We look back in history, some slaves, especially in biblical times, loved their masters. Their masters loved them. And so some slaves chose freely to remain as slaves. That's different than the slavery that we think of. In the Old Testament, a slave was to be set free during the year of Jubilee. I don't know if you remember that in the Old Testament. But if he didn't want to be set free, if he so loved his master, he could take his ear, put it up against a doorpost, and they would drive a stake, a nail through that ear, signifying that I choose freely to remain with my master. I love my master. That's not what we think of when we think of slavery. Some slaves chose to remain in slavery freely because that was the best economic station for them. It made the most sense. It provided a better life. They freely chose to remain slaves. If you look in the Old Testament, it is clear that God has said plainly, slaves are to be treated with care. There are numerous texts, like Exodus chapter 21, for instance. We don't have time to go there. But Exodus 21, throughout the Old Testament, There are numerous texts that describe the wrongful treatment of slaves as being worthy of death, abominable, sinful. Don't treat slaves poorly. Indeed, the punishment was death for abusing slaves, and the ideas that slaves and their families would be separated, children from parents, husbands from wives, families being ripped apart, like we think of when we think of the slave trade, it was outlawed by God. And that doesn't mean that there weren't abuses in Paul's day or that all masters loved their slaves. Remember that centurion? He goes to Jesus. He says, Jesus, my slave's dying. Would you heal him? That's love. It doesn't mean that all masters were like that. But to say that the same abominable practices that we know of in the Civil War era are part of Paul's day is just not accurate. Number three, Paul did want slaves to be free, in case you were wondering. 1 Corinthians 7, 21 through 24, this is what Paul says. Were you called while a slave, speaking of salvation? Don't worry about it. But if you are able to become free, rather do that. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. What's he saying? You can be free, 
If you can be free, Paul says, do it. But no, brethren, no, brethren, whatever your social status is, your eternal status is a free man in Christ. It doesn't matter whether you have an earthly master or not. Both you and the earthly master are slaves to Christ. There's no partiality with God. So Paul's saying, if you can be free, be free. Seek to be liberated from men, but don't you ever get it twisted. Liberation from men is not the issue. Liberation from sin is the issue. Or you think about Paul's letter to Philemon, about his runaway slave, Onesimus, and the way he writes to Onesimus, or to, to Philemon about Onesimus. Onesimus has ran away from Philemon. Probably, it seems like in the text, has stolen things from him, and yet Paul says, he's become a believer now. He's been a new creation, so much so that he's willing to come back to you. And Paul says, would you take him not just as a slave, would you take him as a brother? Would you take him, take him not as a slave, but as a brother, receive him in the Lord. Again, Paul does want slaves to be free. Number four, Paul does not offer a theological foundation for the institution of slavery as he does for marriage and child rearing. Again, I just want to make sure these things are plain so that when we approach this text, we are not saying, well, I'm going to insert my own ideas into what Paul is saying, trying to keep us from this. Paul does not offer a theological foundation for slavery. He offers a theological foundation for husbands leading their wives, doesn't he? He roots it in Genesis chapter 2. If you look there in Ephesians 5, he roots the leadership of husbands and the submission of women in creation. Look in Ephesians chapter 6. He roots the obedience of children, the submission of children to the fifth commandment. And then he says this word, it is right. He approves of these things. But notice that's absent from verses 5 through 9. Paul does not ground the institution of slavery in in an eternal principle. No, rather he simply says, this is real life in the household. All of this, friends, if you look from verse 22 all the way down to, uh, sorry, cha chapter 5, verse 22, all the way down from chapter 6 through 9, it's all about the household. And he's saying, this is real life in the household. We've got slaves in the household. Over half of the population, theologians estimate, would have been slaves in Ephesus. Half. This is real life. So Paul says, live in such a way, slaves and masters and children and husbands and wives, live in such a way that Christ is honored. Live in such a way that it's clear to the world that you are not really the slaves of men, but the slaves of Christ. Paul actually upends the Ephesian understanding of slavery by telling the slave masters, slaves, honor your employers, but then he tells the slave masters, do the same to them. There's mutual submission. Treat your slaves not as property, but as fellow heirs with Christ. Treat your slaves right as God would have you treat them. And listen, in the way you treat your slaves, masters, you serve or abuse God. We'll get into that. Now that should just make you say, wow. If you had all thought or wondered, does the New Testament seem to condone such a practice of Civil War era slavery? You haven't read verse 9 if you think it does. That kind of slavery is being challenged here by Paul for sure. And lastly, by way of introduction, number five, I, I would like to allow James Montgomery Boyce to get us into the actual text here. When in doubt, let Boyce ring out. Here's what he says. What Paul is saying in Ephesians is another way of saying that the slave, no less than the master, has been made in God's image. As such, being made in God's image, he possesses immeasurable worth and great dignity. He's to be treated properly. And it was this transformation of people's hearts which came from viewing all people made in the image of God, and that should influence the way we view the unborn, but it's from this idea that all people are made in God's image that ultimately destroyed slavery in America and in Europe and continues to transform work relationships today. Now listen to this, friends. Listen to this. 
If there's one thing you listen to, this. This is a continuing transformation, and we must all be involved in it. Listen. That's our ultimate answer to the critics who, who asks, why didn't Paul condemn slavery? Why did the Christian church take so many centuries to abolish it? And the answer is really a counter question. Why are you not treating people as God has treated you? Why are you not treating other people as God has treated you? How come it's taken you so long? You see, the problem is not why someone else did not do what he or she should have done quicker, but rather why you and I are not doing what we know we should be doing now. Sheesh. I could end the sermon right there. Right there. I, that's the main idea of this text. How should we live in this world? And the answer is, as slaves of Christ, as slaves of Jesus, as people who've been rescued from hell, who seek to rescue others, counting others more important than ourselves, treating others the way that God has treated us, treating others the way that God has treated you. And therefore, as slaves of Jesus Christ, everything you do, friends, especially in your work, is worship. Your work is worship. If you've been rescued from your sin by the grace of God, trusting in Jesus and His substitutionary sacrifice on the cross, we should live in a way that pleases Him. That's been the book of Ephesians for the past three chapters now. You've been rescued, so please God because of what He's done in your heart. A child of light desires, loves to please the one who's rescued him. That's plain in Ephesians. And so we get to here and we say, yes, I humbly submit to my husband because... Follow Christ. I willingly lead my wife sacrificially because in doing so I follow Christ. I please Him. I humbly submit to my parents because I honor Christ. And now I work so that I might honor Christ. As to the Lord, Paul says. As if I was doing these things, submitting and leading and submitting to my earthly masters, as if I was doing these things to the Lord. Because I am doing these things unto the Lord. And so, friends, I just don't know that we get this. When it says as to the Lord, it really means as to the Lord. He is honored or dishonored in the way I relate to those in my family. He is honored or dishonored in the way I relate to those in my workplace. He is served, listen to this, he is served or he is abused by you in the way that you serve or abuse your family or those in your workplace. If we were to get that, you are abusing the name of God by the way you abuse others. It would transform the way we operate. And so we have difficulties, right? We do not have slavery in our day like Paul had it in his day. But we do have people in employment underneath other people, right? We've got similarities there. And so I think that's our bridge this, this, this morning. It's a, it's a good bridge. We have people that look at an earthly master and say, I will agree to enter under you contractually for a certain service. Very similar to Paul's day. So that's where we go. That's our bridge. Employees and employers. So, first then. Oh, boy. It doesn't work. Wait. If you could go one more slide. Sorry, I don't know where my clicker's at. Employees are called to obedience. To obedience, you are to work obediently, and those are our four points this morning. We will begin with number one. You are called to work obediently with fear and trembling. Notice, brothers and sisters, the use of the word Christ in this section. If you were to look at verses 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, you know what word you'd always keep seeing? Christ, Lord, Master. If you look there with me, every verse has that at least once. Jesus Christ as Lord, Jesus as Christ, Jesus as Master. It's all over the place. Now, notice the command then to you as an employee, bond servants, employee. 
Obey your earthly masters. It could be translated earthly Lord. There's a play in the Greek that we miss in English. But really, it's Paul saying, hey, you got a little L Lord, and you also got a big L Lord. And if you want to obey the big L Lord, Jesus Christ, you've got to obey the little L Lord that he put in place in your life. You obey, beloved, not because your earthly boss is nice. You submit, beloved, not because it's what your earthly boss deserves. Rather, you obey, beloved, because you obey Jesus, who is your ultimate boss. He's way better than a nice boss. He does deserve that kind of obedience. He's your, he's your salvation. The, the Lord Jesus Christ is your rock, your redeemer, your greatest treasure. He's your Lord. So, in obeying your employer, you are obeying the Lord Jesus. In serving you, your employer, you are serving the Lord Jesus. We must get this. Your work, dear ones, is worship. Your work is worship. From husking corn to cooking a meal, from knocking on doors selling insurance, to putting the kids down for a nap, your work is worship. Because you do it as you would to Christ. That's what worship is, doing things unto the Lord. And that's verses 5 all the way through 8. You are doing it for Christ if you are serving your employer with fear and trembling. That's our first point, with fear and trembling. You are serving Christ if you are serving your employer with fear and trembling. That's, that's phrase, that phrase in verse 5 is, shouldn't sound foreign to us. We see this in Mark chapter 5, verse 33. You remember that woman? She's on the road, she has a discharge, and she has years and years and years, all her life it seems like, has not been healed of this discharge. She spent all her money on physicians, and it just nothing has healed her. And she looks at Christ and she says, if I just touch him, if I just, just touch the fringe of his book, I'll be healed. You want to know what a picture of faith looks like? There it is. And she does, right? I mean, sensing the power that has gone out of Christ, Christ turns around and says, who touched me? And with Fear and trembling, that's worship, comes to Christ and says, I did. She falls down and tells him the truth about herself. And Jesus says, daughter, your faith has made you well. There's a connection between fear and trembling and faith. Go in peace. Or Philippians 2.12, what does Paul tell you? Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. It, there's a connection between faith and salvation and fear and trembling, a, a humble contriteness of heart. Your work, your serving your employer as a Christian is bound up in doing things in faith in Christ. Whatever is not done in faith is sin. We know this from the text of Scripture. So everything you do, whether you eat or you drink or you buy a house or you type up a memo for your employer, is done to the glory of God. And therefore is worship. Fear and trembling happens in your heart. Because you know the glory of God is at stake at your work. You get that? Fear and trembling happens in your heart because you know the glory of God is at stake in your work. Fear and trembling happens because you recognize the name of God is on the line. For the repairman... The way that you repair a gadget or a furnace or a faucet or any other item that needs repairing, the way that you repair puts the name of the earthly Lord or your employer on the line. And when you get your name of the employer on the line, you put the name of the Lord on the line. That's what Paul would say here. As to Christ, by the way you repair shingles on a roof, the glory of the Lord is being declared or not. Your work is worship, so you work with fear and trembling. You work in the fear of the Lord. You do what is right, as if God was watching. Because He is watching. Psalm 139, we talked about that for 45 minutes last uh, Sunday. That's, God knows. There is not north, south, east, west, there is no space that God is not. And so you work as if God was right there watching, because He is. God knows how you work when the boss isn't around. God's always there. And speaking of that, does your work ethic change 
when the boss is around or not around? Does fear and trembling only occur when your earthly master is near you? (laughs) And that bleeds into our second characteristic of working obediently for your employer as unto the Lord, and that is number two, with a sincere heart. You work obediently with a sincere heart. As a school teacher, I would be visited multiple times a year to be observed. Anybody know what observation is in the school system? Some of us do. When you get observed, you don't ever get told when the principal's coming in. He just barges in through your door while you're mid-lesson, and he sits in the back of your room and types notes and criticizes you, which is great. And my first two years as a school teacher, I just every time my principal would swing in through the door and all the kids would just, you know, so you got that, now they're not normal, and you're not normal because my face was, you know, just get red and <laughs> trying to finish my lesson without my voice cracking. And I realized after a, a couple years of this, why do I only exhibit fear and trembling when my boss comes in? Like, what does it only happen? Why does all that happen in my heart when my earthly boss comes in? I mean, the king of kings, the lord of all earthly lords, is always sitting in the back and in the front and in the sides of my classroom. Always. I should seek to be on top of my game every day in every class, whether my principal is in there or not, because the boss of my boss is observing me. So I'd start wrestling. Grant, are you working with a sincere heart? And the question to you then is, do you perk up when the boss comes around? (laughs) Straighten up a little bit. Why is that? Could it be because you are not serving your employer with a sincere heart as unto the Lord? A sincere heart is one of integrity, wholeheartedness, purity. A sincere heart manifests itself in work that is always done with excellence, always done without slacking, because it's motivated not by impressing the boss when he's around, but rather motivated by a desire to honor Jesus, who is always around. Friends, what happens when our employer enters our workspace gives us a huge window into our own hearts. Are our motives right for the way we've been working? Is there integrity there? Can you smile when your boss approaches? Not because you're nervous like a smile like this, he's coming. I mean a real smile where you say, God is pleased with my work. I can't wait for my earthly boss to see that. God's pleased with it. Wow. I want to work that way. And uh, a word to mothers here. Mothers, changing a diaper, cooking a meal, doing the laundry, showing your little girl the wonder of the ABCs, cleaning up the milk spill for the fifth time that afternoon. Such work, when done unto the Lord with a sincere heart, is worship to the Lord. And I go further than that. In the midst of worship, it's communion with God. We get so caught up as men and women thinking that my quiet time needs to be a a certain cup of coffee, a certain amount of time, uh, I need to read this amount of my Bible, and I'm not saying reading the Bible is wrong. You should absolutely read the text of Scripture. But your text, your text reading, Your ability to sit down with a latte is not going to be the same as you were in college. People in college have such a false view of true spirituality almost all the time. I did. It's not real life being able to spend two hours in the morning. What's real life, spending 15, 20 minutes hearing from God and then him saying, now go do And I'll go with you, Grant, and talk with me when you do this thing. And remember what I told you, and talk back with me. And when you get a chance, come back, I'll tell you some more. Mothers, do not think that you are at all missing out on communion and fellowship with God 
in the midst of a diaper change. I changed my daughter's diaper this morning. And by God's grace, you know, I popped that thing open. This is yucky. No offense. And I, I just limp. Jesus has been infinitely more for me. My filth is so much worse than that filth in that little diaper. Communion with God in that moment. Thank you, Lord. Work is worship. And the same is true for one that is pleasing to Christ. A life that is pleasing to Christ, when you work obediently with service to Christ, you are worshiping. That's our third point. Work obediently with service to Christ. Or put another way, work obediently to please Christ. Simple. This third characteristic of an obedient employer, both to his earthly master and ultimately and more importantly to his heavenly master, is found there in verse 6, if you want to look there with me. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Paul says to the slave, don't be a people pleaser. Be a God pleaser. As one freed from sin, seek always to live under the watchful eye of Christ and seek to please him. When the master isn't around, God still is, and God is the boss of your boss. So it matters if you cheat your earthly boss, because if you cheat your earthly boss, you cheat who? You cheat God. Do we think of work this way? Do the will of God from the heart, Paul says. The will of God is that you work hard from a sincere heart that pleases God, that pleases Christ. Dear ones, don't go to work tomorrow and wonder, how hard do I need to work today to make my employer happy? That's the wrong question. That's the wrong question. You don't get it. You don't get Paul here. Paul's saying, that's the wrong question. The right question is, how can I work in such a way To honor the God, my God, who has saved me and liberated me from my sin. How can I work in such a way? Don't look for the line of what's what's acceptable. The Christian boyfriend never looks at the line in the car and says, How close can I get with my girlfriend until it's over the line? That's not the Christian. The the Christian Christian never toes the line of work and says, How how close can I get to the line before, before it's dishonoring to the Lord? The true Christian doesn't want anything to do with the line. Wants to run way far away from the line. There is no line. He loves Christ. He does. He wants to please Christ. He wants to serve as if he was serving Jesus himself. So he doesn't look for a line to say, how, you know, what's good enough? So I think a good question for us all to ask is, can anyone distinguish you? Can anyone distinguish you as a Christian worker by what you produce as an employee? Is your output and the way in which you produce things for your employer distinguishable from your pagan co-workers? That's what Paul has in mind here. You're working with service to Christ. Your work is worship. Does your worship then look like pagans? And as one redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, it cannot. In the strength that God supplies by his grace in Christ, it is the will of God that you work hard. It's the will of God that you submit to your employer so long as it doesn't lead you to sin. We'll get to that. So long as it doesn't contradict the law of God. It is the will of God that you work as workers for Jesus. And that's not just for preachers. It's not just for preachers and pastors. Your work is worship. Just because I get to sit downstairs in my office a lot of the time, be able to study God's word does not mean that you are just not able to commune with God in the way that I am. That's not, to me, a biblical concept. Tell me where you see that in the scriptures. Yes, there is a uniqueness to my job, and I give praise to God, and I just thank you for giving me the sweet honor of being able to study God's word. But you too have communion with God throughout the day. Because your work is worship.
And even if you think that you're self-employed, right? Well, I don't have an employer. Yes, you do. As someone who's been ransomed from their sin, if you've repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus, you're always under the employ of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're always under his employment. So Colossians 3.17. Colossians 3.17 is, is true. Whatever, does, whatever you do, whether in, in, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And you do that because you've been given the capacity in Christ to do this. You don't have to work like everyone else anymore. You don't work like a dead person anymore because Jesus has made you alive in the gospel. If you go to work and you, you work like a dead person, it's inconsistent with what Christ has done in your life. And when God makes dead people alive, you know what he does? Dead people act a lot differently than alive people. So when you get made alive, you are different. And if you at all think, well, that's not true, go to a cemetery. Only one kind of people get to leave. Alive people, only the living get to leave. Only the spiritual living in Christ will work like that. Is your behavior at work categorized more by death or more by life? John Stott sums it up this way. That's so good. It is possible for the housewife to cook a meal as if Jesus Christ was going to eat it. Oh. Or to spring clean the house as if Jesus Christ were to be the honored guest. It is possible for teachers to educate children, for doctors to treat patients, nurses to care for them, for solicitors to help clients, shop assistants to serve customers, accountants to audit books, and secretaries to type letters as if in each case they were serving Jesus Christ. The fourth and final characteristic of an employee's obedience is goodwill. Their obedience is defined by goodwill. And that's in verse 7. Rendering service with a goodwill as to the Lord and not to man. Kent Hughes uh, issues an illustration that is helpful in his commentary on Ephesians for this verse. Let me... Let me quote him. This idea that we are to go about our tasks with cheerful goodwill, with pleasantness. Well, we have all met Christian sourpusses, a, a contradiction of terms. But they do exist. Who bring unpleasantness to everything, even driving. As the little boy innocently said to his mother, Mommy, why do all the idiots only come out when daddy's driving? Our text uses the word goodwill. It's an inclination towards goodness, a zealous desire, a zealous desire for kindness, an eagerness to love, a wholehearted yearning to be kind and considerate, to show favor, to be loving, to be loving. Some have translated to work with enthusiasm, to work with joy. I think goodwill seems to capture it best. So in your work, Christian, zealously desire the good of your employer. In your work, Christian, eagerly desire the welfare of your earthly master. Desire their welfare. Because in serving your earthly master this way, you are serving Christ. So how many of us have abused Jesus Christ? By doing the exact opposite. Zealously desiring the demise of our employers. Eagerly spreading gossip and discontentedness like gangrene over the hearts and souls and minds of our fellow employees. Because we don't like our employer. So that the name of Christ is lifted high. So that the name of Christ is honored? No, in dishonoring your employer, you have dragged the name of Jesus Christ through the same mud. So how do you speak about your boss? What's the lunchroom look like 
When the boss comes in, does everybody get quiet? Why is that? Why is that? Could it be because rather than having goodwill towards our employer, we have given anything but goodwill? So I would encourage you, beloved, watch yourself this week. In what ways do you serve your Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, by the way you serve? You truly serve your earthly Lord. In the manner in which you speak about them, and the manner in which you do things for them, and the manner in which you talk to them, and most importantly, and most convictingly, and the manner in which you pray for them, it would be probably painful for most of us in here to think hard about the way we've prayed for those in our workplace, especially those who are the most unpopular, the head honchos. When was the last time you pleaded before the throne of grace for the sake of your employer? When was the last time that you got on your knees and begged for the salvation of your employer, the same employer that wants you to get a shot, the same employer that demands you wear a mask, the same employer that does not have goodwill towards you? Did you have goodwill towards God? Is that, is that, is that why we don't do that? I had goodwill towards God, therefore my earthly employer, for me to honor him, he must have goodwill towards me. What? We had no goodwill, and yet Christ rescued us. He is our example. The Lord Jesus would have you extend goodwill towards your employer. Goodwill. But as I alluded to, there is one additional element of goodwill that cannot be left unsaid. It's essential. Goodwill is a desire for the good of your employer. Goodwill is a zeal to love him or her best. Therefore, goodwill, love, demands that you tell your employer the truth. Goodwill demands that you tell your employer the truth. You tell them the truth about God, the truth about God's law, when they exercise their authority wrongly. For instance, if, you asked, if your employer asked you to lie, hey, we know we can't get this product out in like two months, but to get the sale... Tell them we can get it in two weeks. We can't, but tell them. What do you do in that situation? In that moment, you're faced with a decision. Obey God or obey man. What do you do? Do you submit to your employer in that situation? I'll let Scripture tell you. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. And Peter and the apostles answered to them, We must obey God rather than man. It's been consistent in all of this section in Ephesians from when we talked about wives submitting to husbands and children submitting to parents and, and now bond servants submitting to slaves. It's been consistent. Submit to the Lord. Submit in the Lord. As to the Lord. As to the Lord. It's consistent all the way through. So if you cannot do what you do to the glory of God, if you cannot do what your employer is asking you to do, to do to the glory of your heavenly master, if you cannot do it as if you would be doing it for Jesus, you cannot obey your earthly masters. You are not slaves ultimately of men. You are slaves preeminently of who? Christ. So wives, if your husband says you can't join a church, but the scripture is plain that it's imperative that you join a church as a member, then you must obey God rather than men. Likewise, employees, if your boss asks you to lie, you must obey God rather than men. It's not protesting for the sake of protesting. Well, he's a Democrat. <laughs> I'll show him. That's sin. But if he is asking you to break God's law, or she is asking you to break God's law, it's not protesting for the sake of protesting. It's resisting for the sake of goodwill. For the sake of God's glory and the good the real good of your employer. In fact, I would argue it's the most loving thing for you to resist and say, I can't do that. You are asking me to violate God's law. You will have to give an account employer one day, just as I. You will stand before God. 
love demands that I tell my employer that they are breaking God's commands and goodwill demands it, so I should tell my re- employer, repent. Don't do this. Don't go down that road. Let me show you the better way. And this, of course, bleeds into the reality of everyone. I think everyone's probably, I don't know. Most people in here probably think, what about the vaccine mandates? Come on, give it to me. (laughs) There is no law from God saying that thou shall or shall not be vaccinated. Are we all hearing that, friends? There is no law in this body that says, in this word that says, thou shalt be vaccinated, thou shalt not. But there is a law that says, thou shalt do whatever you do to the glory of God. Anyone in this church, and I say this in full of love, but I just want to make sure it's plainly articulated according to God's word. Anyone in this church who says that the only way to be an obedient Christian is to not get the vaccine is no better than a Pharisee. Anyone in this church who says the only way to be an obedient Christian is to get the vaccine is no better than a Pharisee. You are adding to God's law. God has provided liberty among Christians to get a vaccine or not. That should be plain for us, friends. Let us allow our theology be dictated not by politics, but by the word of God. And some of us will tell our employer, yes, I can do that in faith as to the Lord. I can get a vaccine. I can put on a mask. I can get vaccinated to the glory of God. Amen. And with full sincerity of your heart, with fear and trembling, because you are serving Christ You work obediently to the Lord and you get the shot. And some of us in here will say, I can't obey you in the vaccine mandate. I can't do this in faith. What is not done in faith for me is sin. So please, employer, please don't make me go against my conscience. Whatever I am supposed to do, I'm supposed to do to the glory of God and Some of us in here, I think, will say, I can't get this vaccine to God's glory. Can't do it. My temple's a body of the Holy Spirit. My my body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. I just can't, can't do it to the glory of God. And what does not proceed from faith, of course, is sin. And so, employer, to ask me to do this is sin for me. Doesn't mean it's sin for my other brother here, but it's sin for me. So don't do this. God hasn't given you new authority, employer, over my body. He hasn't given you authority ultimately over me. And so love demands, goodwill demands that with a sincere heart, a sincere heart, not because you don't like Biden, but because you love Christ and you want to honor your employer. You want to honor him best thing by not complying by not submitting and the wonder of our day is that it's so much different than Paul's day right I mean you can get an earthly new a new earthly master right I mean it's possible in Paul's day a slaves the odds of you getting a new master are slim to none if your master says do it you can say please don't make me do it and the master says you're doing it anyway And so slaves would suffer for righteousness' sake. They would suffer for righteousness' sake. I think we lose the other half of what Jesus said, right? Jesus said, blessed are you and you suffer for the gospel's sake and for righteousness' sake. We lose that other side. Well, listen to 1 Peter 2.20. If if you, as a slave, might suffer for righteousness' sake, 1 Peter Peter 2.20 is for you. Peter writes, for what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. If you do what is right and you suffer for it, this finds favor with God. For you've been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his footsteps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled himself, He did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. 
And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. Let me just get this, beloved. You are to submit in all things as to the Lord. And when you cannot submit to an earthly authority because to do so would be to disobey God, to do so would be disobey God, you obey God instead and you obey Christ who hung on the cross there for you when you were an enemy of God and he did not revile you. You then, if that is your example, if that is your treasure, you love this way, you serve your employer this way in the manner in which Christ served you with goodwill, with love. You stand on the truth. You tell the truth. That's goodwill. You do not lie. You do not go against your conscience, even in the midst of losing a job for righteousness' sake. But you remember Jesus, and you do not sin against your employer by reviling them. Far be it for any of us to revile our employer. That takes your stand for Jesus and destroys it. You can't do that. You can't revile to the glory of God. Rather, in the way you extend goodwill, in the way you extend grace, may it cause our employers to have great sadness to let you go. I gotta let him go, he won't obey me. But man, that person worked like he was working for someone else. Because he was. In fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as to Christ, I implore you, beloved, and extend goodwill to your earthly master and your work will be worshipped. Now these kinds of realities will have all kinds of bearings and all kinds of additional things work-related, right? Uh, things like, should you join a workers' union? Should you participate in a strike? Those questions need to be answered with your Bible open and your knees on the ground. And how many of us have done that? We should ask these questions. Can I do these things as unto the Lord? Can I enter into this union or participate in this strike to the glory of God? Does this extend goodwill towards my employer? Does this communicate gospel truth to them and to my co-workers, my fellow slaves? Can I do this with a sincere heart, with fear and trembling before the Lord? I cannot answer that. God will. So with fear and trembling, on your knees, ask him to answer those questions. And every day, if you do that every day of your life, you'll be worshipped. Every day. Lastly, and very briefly, we have the command given to masters. I think, I don't think this one works. We have the command given to masters. Paul in brief is, is so brief he gives one verse to the masters right right masters verse 9 do the same to them stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him so if you are an employer or you're an employee there is no partiality with God both you and the master are slaves to Christ you will both stand before him one day and as one brother puts it this is so good. Social or economic status will not give anyone an advantage on the day of judgment. No special consideration will be given to those who have made a great name for themselves in this life. No special consideration. At the cross, Christ has taken the two and made them one. Has he not? At the cross, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So rule that way. Fear God. Stop threatening. Treat those under your care in a way that reflects the way that God has treated you. And the way that you treat those under your care is an indication of your heart or lack thereof for Christ. The way you treat those under your care, not just employees, but your wife, but your children, is an indication of of your heart or lack thereof of Christ for Christ. So 
I'll say it one more time. Your work, your worship. And so by way of conclusion, let me give you just one last reminder here. If you're a Christian, at the cost of his life, Christ redeemed you from slavery to sin. And you have a new master now, right? The life giver. The life giver is your new master. The forgiver is your new master. The one who can forgive lazy employees and make them not lazy anymore. The one who can take failed employers and change them and forgive them. This is your new master. This gracious Savior, this wonderful advocate for the Father, this King of Kings is our master and Savior. So you can say with Isaac Watts, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I had done he groaned upon the tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. So may we submit to one another. May we, as Watts just said in that hymn, give ourselves away to Christ, to one another, in the home, in the workplace, as to the Lord. May we treat one another as God has treated us personally in Christ. May we treat one another as God has treated us personally in Christ. Let's ask for his help. Father in heaven, so many words. Would you cause the gospel of Jesus Christ to so permeate our hearts and minds that in the way we look at our fellow employers, the way we look at our fellow employees, the way we look at our husbands and wives and children, that we would say, it's hard bearing with one another. But I have to keep the gospel in mind because, Lord, you have risen. You've taken my life and raised it up. And my life isn't mine anymore. Would that be our hearts to be so marveled at the gospel, to be so captured by the reality that our life is hid now with Christ on high, that we look at all these relationships and say, I want to treat them as you have so graciously treated me. Cause us to bend the gospel to one another for your glory, God, and that the nations would be glad in the Savior.